Hola, that's about the limit of my Spanish, I'm afraid. So, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Nicola. I used to be BT's futurologist, which, aside from being quite difficult to say, uh, is also, it always, always provokes the same question, which was, do I have a crystal ball? Um, and the answer to that question is, yes, I do. It doesn't work, unfortunately, but, uh, but frankly, reading tea leaves, looking at crystal balls is not my job. And recently, my job title has got a little bit more boring, uh, so I am no longer a futurologist. The crystal ball has been removed. Um, I'm now uh, head of customer insight and futures in BT's global innovation team. Um, so what does that actually mean? Um, well, I'm a researcher by background. Um, we're, I'm part of a, a very big team of innovators around BT, a global team of innovators. Uh, but I am based um, just outside Ipswich in the east of England in a massive complex that we call Adastral Park, which is our main research and development organization. It's the hub of our global innovation organization. So um, my role as part of... Uh, BT's innovation process is to try and understand us, customers, um, and try and understand some of the weird behaviors that are going on at the moment in the customer uh, population. Um, now, I'm not a technologist. I am surrounded by a lot of technologists in BT. Um, I'm actually a psychologist by background, uh, which is why I kind of like to look at how behaviors are changing. And obviously, technology plays a huge part in that. Um, so my role largely is to research customer behavior, look at trends, and really then work with people like yourselves. And I work with global clients around the world in the banking industry, in the retail industry, airlines, government, always fun, um, to try and actually figure out what do these behaviors mean for us as organizations trying desperately to provide fantastic customer experiences. So, what I'm going to talk about today is some research that we've actually done over a number of years. Um, so probably all in all, about 10 years we've been doing this research. But I'm going to focus in on one piece that we have been doing um, that we've done three times in the past five years. And the reason why that's fascinating is that we can start to see some significant customer trends in terms of how they contact organizations and their attitudes towards customer experience. So the survey this year, I like to say, is bigger and better than ever before. Um, it's certainly bigger. Um, we've just done uh, 10 countries in this survey. Uh, so we've taken a sample across Europe. Obviously, today, I'm going to focus in on the Spanish data, uh, but certainly across Europe, we've also looked at Germany and Belgium and the UK. We've taken a sample in the US and also across Asia. Uh, so we've looked at China, India, United Arab Emirates, Indonesia and Singapore. And really, the reason why this provides a really fascinating data set, uh, it's just over 5,500 customers we asked, is that we can start to see some very significant cultural differences. And actually, in Spain, you are the most advanced in Europe in terms of the way that you're doing customer experience and the, the, the expectations of, of customers. And I think largely that's because you are much more switched on about smartphones than certainly a lot of the rest of Europe. Uh, but there is an east-west split in this data. Asia is behaving very differently. Um, so I'll point that out as we go along. So, eight trends. The first one um, has already been touched upon, to be honest, um, which is all about effort, easy, loyalty. Now, the interesting thing is that over the five years that we've been doing this research, loyalty has been going down in our customer base. And it's not surprising, frankly, we have a lot more choice as consumers now. So actually, why should we be loyal? That's one fundamental question. So we're not generally, although there certainly are, are loyalty behaviors in the market, largely because we're too lazy to shift companies frequently. 
So loyalty we can't take for granted. Satisfaction, as you heard earlier, does not buy you loyalty necessarily. So you can have ecstatically happy customers who are recommending you that sometimes do not stay with you. So what's the answer? And actually the answer was started to be provided in 2010 when the Harvard Business Review uh, published a paper saying, don't worry about satisfying your customers, just make it easy for them. And actually last week in London, I was speaking uh, on, a, on the same platform as a guy called Matt Dixon, who actually did that research. And it's kind of counterintuitive, because we always got taught, wow, the customer. And that still is the case. We still look for incredibly good customer service. But wow may not buy you loyalty. In fact, customers might not even notice that they are being wowed. So can we make it easier for customers? So certainly our Spanish customers in the research were saying, 87% of them were saying, make it easy for me and I will probably come back to you. Although actually, interestingly enough, Spain came quite low in terms of the easy comparison between the 10 countries we looked at. Um, so it may not be as high a priority in Spain. However, I have to say the one statistic that shocked me the most in this survey and shocked me exceptionally in Spain was the fact that first contact resolution in Spain was the lowest of any of the 10 countries that we looked at. Only one in 20 of our autonomous customers said that they were getting first contact resolution. Now, I had the pleasure of uh, having dinner with, uh, with a few people who were probably out there uh, last night and asked the question, why is that happening in Spain? And we think possibly the answer is that Spanish customers do like, well, they don't like calling in, but they have a habit of calling in multiple times, possibly about the same problem. But can we make things easier for customers? And certainly in BT, we, we tried the customer effort score, which is one of the popular things that dropped out of the Harvard Business School research. We didn't like the customer effort score in BT, mainly because customers kept saying, it's not an easy score. Um, because the official question was, how much effort did you need to put forth that's the official English way of putting it. Put forth in order to listen to this presentation on a scale of one to seven. Now, our feedback from customers were, we don't understand the question. So actually, what we did was we shamelessly stole the Net Promoter Score. Um, and we turned it into the Net Easy Score. And actually, for the past two and a half years in BT in the UK, we have been asking our customers, how easy was it to do business with us today? Not on a one to seven scale, on a one to three, it's either easy, it's difficult, or you don't really know. And frankly, it's not rocket science. Customers who are finding us difficult are more likely to churn than customers that are finding us easy. So we do find a very profound link into loyalty. We also find a very profound link into things like first contact resolution. Because as soon as the customer has had to contact us more than three times, our easy score plummets. So we know that they're is a link with things like Net Promoter. They're more likely to recommend, they're more likely to stay, they're more likely to be satisfied, and also a link into internal processes. So for us, we are using NetEasy as a strategic score on our scorecard to try and drive loyalty behaviors that are not inherently there because of choice. So easy could be the new loyalty. That's the first trend. The second one is a very interesting one that came up this year more strongly than it has in the past few years. Now, we called the research the autonomous customer for a reason. Autonomous customers like the control of doing things themselves. So actually, autonomous customers are perfectly happy to serve themselves if it is easy. However, as organizations, we've been a bit naughty. So what we have done is thought, well, if they don't want to contact us, let's just hide all our contact details so they don't contact us and we save lots of money. Now, 
What we're finding this year is autonomous customers will do quite a lot themselves if it is easy. But actually, if it isn't, if they have a problem, they still want to contact. Therefore, we need as organizations to make sure that the phone, a phone number, is somewhere on the site that is easy to find because the phone is still the primary mechanism for many of the customers to contact us. Email is still very popular, albeit I call email a slow tennis match. So you hit an email in. I got one back. I don't understand it. Hit another one in. We've all been there. It's horribly slow. It's difficult to have a conversation on email. So email is still popular, but actually, is it effective? Is it efficient? Social media is growing, as well as things like web chat. Actually, again, unusually, Spain Social media is more popular as a contact mechanism than web chat. That is unusual. Again, you were unique in our survey of the 10 countries we looked at. So rather than hide our details away, how do we make it easier to signpost customers to their goal? That links, I mean, also on apps, on mobile, across the website as well. So Apps, let's put the contact details on the app as well, because people don't want to come out of the app and try and find the phone number or the contact details on the website. That link, this one links to the third trend, which is about the trendy one, omni-channel. Now, we've just finished a piece of research that will be published in about three weeks' time. It's called the omni-channel swap shop. And it's really trying to understand this omni-channel stuff. Why do we use one channel at one time and another channel another? The psychology is very interesting, but we asked the consumers, the customers that we interviewed, we asked them, are you omni-channel? And they looked at us and went, what's that? So we're not omni-channel as customers. We don't think of ourselves as omni-channel. That is the language which we use as customer experience professionals. Not what the customers call it. Customers are goal-directed. They have a goal. They want to get to their goal. They want to get to it easily. And they do use a lot more channels because, frankly, they have a lot more channel choices, particularly using smartphones. What we typically find is a smartphone customer uses more channels rather than less channels. So they are very omni-channel, but we use different tools for different things. And again, signposting is very critical for this, but there is a strategic decision also to be made on omni-channel because we can open up lots of channels to customers, lots of doors into our organization. But unless we have the connecting corridors at the back, we're going to get a very disjointed experience. And certainly in Spain, there are lots of channel choices and things like WhatsApp was bubbling up as a channel choice. Again, similar to Asia, not getting that in the rest of Europe. But because people are on WhatsApp, they want to use potentially WhatsApp to engage with organizations. The problem, of course, is that WhatsApp have no open APIs at the moment. So it's difficult to integrate it into something like a contact center. And would you want to is the big question. Because as we open more channels up, our complexity goes up, and the customer experience probably goes down. Now, certainly, this is accelerated by our fourth trend, the fact that we are getting some seriously mobile-centric consumers. And as I said, in Spain, you are unusual in Europe in that your population is coming out as very, very highly addicted to smartphones and apps. So how do we create... We create a monster, frankly. It's a monster customer that we're dealing with because they are using more channels rather than less channels. So they are, if you're lucky enough for them to download an app of yours, which is difficult. If you're a bank, they might do it. If you're a retailer, they might do it. If you're a telecoms company, you probably won't. If you're a utilities company or government, you probably won't. So they are using apps when it's appropriate, but they're also using the website, so make sure that's mobile enabled, and also make sure it doesn't contradict the app, because that then creates confusion, which creates contact. And they're probably also more likely to tweet particularly if they're rather grumpy about something, they are more likely to tweet than any other customer. 
which is why it's very important to start to align all these channels together. But these devices are incredible devices, uh, and certainly in the innovation area, we're looking at things that apps enable us to do. So things like visual IVR, where you've authenticated into the app, and you can then do the press one, press two, press three, rather than on the voice channel, actually within the app, it then routes the call or routes the contact, because it could be a web chat, to the appropriate person at the back end, making things a lot easier for the customer. We can use location-based information potentially as well. So how do we link that into the customer experience? So we're on the beginnings of the journey with a smartphone, but it does create some very significantly different behaviors. And certainly that's where the east-west split comes in. In Singapore, there are more smartphones than people, and certainly their behaviors are very, very different typically than most of Europe, with probably the exception of Spain. Um, the fifth one I was surprised about, actually, um, in that uh, there is an increasing awareness of security across all channels. And actually, when I think about it, I shouldn't be so surprised because in the press, nearly every day at the moment, there's a lot of news around hacking and hack attacks and people's personal details being stolen. So there is an increased awareness amongst customers that their data could be sensitive and they don't want insecurity. Now, the problem there, and I work with a lot of banks on this at the moment, is that the more secure you make things, often the less easy they are. So it contradicts trend number one. So I am the person that forgets all their PIN numbers or gets them wrong. Um, and frankly, I have locked myself out of most of my bank accounts at the moment because I can't do that. So how do we make things more secure but also easier? And certainly things like biometrics, not a new thing, frankly. We've been talking about biometrics for at least 15 years. But could we make biometric information, um, basically mean my thumbprint could be my identity. Even the iPhone has the thumbprint mechanism on them. Can we make things secure and easy using technologies, using biometrics? So that's number five. Number six. Video culture is growing. It's small at the moment, but certainly we're doing a lot more on FaceTime and Skype. Certainly talking to each other over that. But do we want to talk to large organizations? And certainly I know in Spain, a lot of the banks have already adopted things like video, particularly for those higher value things, so mortgage advice. Certainly in terms of medical advice, we're seeing um, certainly apps like Babylon coming along where you pay a small amount of money, but you get access, video access to your doctor on your phone through an app. Now, that's brilliant. We do know that video is very powerful. However, there are, there are a few psychological issues with video. One certainly is coming through on the data, appearance. So customers often want one way rather than two way video. They want to see the agent. They don't want the agent to see them. Largely because if the agent sees them, we have to dress, at least the top half of us. We have to comb our hair, do our makeup. It's all a bit too much. So actually, our appearance could be potentially a problem. But in my view, and we're trialing this at the moment, in my view, one-way video takes a lot of the advantages of video away. So certainly the agent is at a disadvantage if they can't see the customer. So, we're seeing video emerge as maybe a high value channel. We're also seeing video emerge as a service as well. So YouTube certainly is being used by younger consumers, um, mainly because they've forgotten how to read, um, but it's being used by young consumers to solve problems. So can we start to use video as a service? And again, in the innovation area in BT, we're working with an Israeli startup at the moment called Idemu to actually create personal videos. So personalized video is, and we've just worked with Barclays to do this. So we take your information and actually put it into a video, usually about one and a half to two minutes long, explaining your mortgage and your mortgage payments and when at some point you're going to pay it off. And actually for Barclays customers, um, they've just got an email with that kind of video in. They can click through, authenticate, and it's personal to them. 
And we're getting some incredible results uh, from that in terms of actually creating more positive conversations with Barclays and maybe def de uh, deflecting some of the calls into their contact center. So video, I think, is small at the moment, but we've got potential to grow it as a contact channel. But we do need to think about, well, I call it the underpants problem, the, uh, the appearance problem, that we do have to dress to do this kind of stuff, which is why certainly a lot of banks are doing it in branch. Hopefully you're dressed when you're in branch. OK, so video. Social media, you knew I was going to talk about because social media does also, it's a public channel. It creates some quite interesting demands. In Spain, it does seem to be used quite a lot by customers, often to try and embarrass brands into action. And certainly, it can create pressures. So 55% of our Spanish customers were saying that they expect a response to a social media interaction within 15 minutes, which is quite a challenging service level agreements. In fact, the research that we did last year on social media was showing that even the best brands weren't necessarily meeting that 15-minute deadline. Sometimes it was eight minutes, sometimes it was eight hours, sometimes it was never. But this is a very public channel. And certainly, the ability to pull people from a public channel into a private channel, like a phone call, like a web chat, makes a lot of sense in the social environment. But if our social team doesn't have a phone or access to chats, we have a problem. And certainly, I think social media really does push this omni-channel agenda. So social media is creating a very different type of customer. The final trend I want to talk about I call it the emerging ecosystem. It's also called the me economy. This is a very small trend at the moment, but my instinct says that this will grow significantly into the future because we have the Internet of Things coming along. We have smart cities, and certainly we have smart customers with smartphones. We're leaving a lot of data trails around. So how do we as organizations take this personal data and actually create better experiences? The trouble is that if I do give you my information, if I trust you to give my information, which is a very big if, what are you going to do with it? How are you going to create an incredible customer experience for me? Because increasingly as customers, we are starting to realize the value of our data. If we give you our data, we want something back. And that's a really interesting thing. As we go into the future, is information feedback, responses, recommendations. Are they all going to become part of this me economy where customers want recognition, potentially advant uh, advantages, preferences, privileges um, in terms of customer service if they share their data with you? This is small but growing. Regulation is very much behind on this, so we're still working out of the regulation. Trust is absolutely central because people are very concerned about the security of their data. But in my opinion, this is definitely the trend for the future. The ecosystem, it is frankly all about me. And it's, of course, all about you as well. So those were the eight global trends that we're seeing from the autonomous customer research. If you are interested in actually getting a copy of the full research, please do tweet me, link in with me, email me. I'm very, very happy to share it. Meanwhile, thank you very much for listening.